Hi, my name is Anna Pimenta and I'm the King Island Regional Land Care Facilitator. Part of my job is to help farmers become more resilient and to promote conversations between farmers themselves and the science community. So the idea of doing this video became when I realized that the power that images and videos can have in transferring knowledge and information to others. And I wanted to give farmers the opportunity to connect, to share, to speak and to be listened to. And in my job I deal with a lot of farmers, with a lot of contractors and researchers and I soon realised that there was a lot of good work being done here on King Island. So why not take advantage of that? Why not share those good, uh, those good practices with everyone? And I would like to, I also wanted to know the why, so why people are doing this and that and would it suit me and it, would it suit the others? So I decided to compile this video of focusing on different areas of King Island with, and, and from farm diversification to pasture management and, bu and bush protection. And we are not competitors on King Island, we all be farmers, we sell the same product for the same price. So why not share what we do best with others? So this video is about that, it's about the sharing of experiences and knowledge and extend our successes to our neighbours and fellow farmers. So come in and open the gates. Simon Valleycoop has a farm at Yellow Rock, north of King Island, 2,000 hectares of mixed coastal and productive land. His coast block has been heavily impacted by wallabies in the past. Simon will be telling us how he managed the wallaby problem and how this impacted on the farm productivity. It uh, probably started uh, in the uh, early 90s, uh, it started to uh, build up. Yeah, from uh, you know it was getting harder and harder to use uh, 1080 and uh, about we started shooting about uh, with Shane um, uh, seriously about a uh, bit of probably 15 months ago I think I'm guessing and uh, yeah I think between us and the uh, neighbours we've uh, he's shot about 7,000. Yeah, we used to do uh, you know a bit of shooting ourselves, but obviously uh, it wasn't enough. So uh, now we can uh, yeah, run more stock again. I noticed just in the last year we really noticed that we can run more, yes. Uh, before we started shooting, yes, we, we would feed probably um, yeah, every second day we'd go out there and uh, feed, feed mobs. We were probably feeding about 200 bales of uh, hay out there uh, during the winter time and uh, but now I'd say we probably have cut it back to half. Yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, grows more feed. Before the shooting, uh, we probably ran about uh, six to seven hundred uh, cows during the winter in split herds. Uh, you know, they'd be there for two to three months max. And uh, now we can uh, probably run about eight hundred. So in uh, in the last recent years, uh, we each year we try and plant a new uh, uh, paddock of lucerne and. Uh, but the, yeah, the kangaroos had really give it a hard time. So finally, we we put up a kangaroo fence between the the lighter coast and uh, on the boundary, and uh, that's uh, made a huge uh, difference. Uh, our plans for the future is to uh, to yeah, do more, uh, yeah, keep up with the maintenance shooting at the moment. Anyway, uh, while returns are good and. We'll uh, also uh, yeah, increase our uh, kangaroo fencing. Uh, we'll keep uh, keep on that after seeing the good results. Mm. Mm. Robbie Payne and his family own a commercial and start Angus operation as well as sheep production on the north of King Island, mainly Ricara Road. We know Robbie has been a man of savings, but if there's one thing he's proud of saving is the bush. Robbie's farm has 30% of native vegetation protected. He will tell us how he has achieved this and what motivated him to do it. That original sale to settlement block was about 225 hectares. Um, it would have been developed and from bush country and cleared at a face. So basically there was no vegetation left. Um, we currently run uh, a bit over a thousand hectares. 
of of the thousand odd acres, there's a thousand odd hectares. There's actually um, about three hundred hectares in total that is either remnant vegetation that's been retained or bush country that we've fenced off or re-established shelter breaks and um, woodlots. You know, with the recognition of um, how the shelter benefited the livestock and the fact that um, you know, in the middle of winter, the 60% of the uh, food intake of an animal is basically utilised in maintaining its bodily functions. Um, there was a considerable increase in production that we could see could be achieved if we could provide better shelter and um, also the improvement in grass production because of the warmer conditions leading out from the shelter. Um, so we, we progressed from um, the biodiversity of protecting remnants, or protecting the riparian, to then protecting remnants that were established previously. Once we had fenced off the um, remnant and riparian areas, the wallaby population um, significantly increased, and the damage that they uh, started to do by um, basically um, taking out the uh, re recovery process within that natural environment um, meant that we had to then do something significant about the wallaby population. We started on a major fencing program and one of the key members at the time, David Robertson, suggested that rather than individually fence each farm or sections of, that we look at a major fencing program of our Ricara area, which ended up being done um, to the extent of about 30 kilometres of fencing. The benefits of the um, shelter um, restoration, um, the re-veg programs um, are something that we will continue as a, as a um, farming practice and um, I'm quite sure that the, um, the small loss of area in establishing these um, vegetation, woodlots, whatever, is far outweighed by the increased production in the total of the farm. Carmen Holloway met her husband James Hill on King Island. She grew up growing her own food and has always been passionate about agriculture. Coming to a beef farm on King Island, she could see so many opportunities apart from the beef production. For 15 years, Carmen has been documenting the change that her farm has had by modifying the landscape to accommodate different enterprises. This is her journey about farm diversification and sustainability. Yeah, in 1999, I found out about permaculture because I was always interested in gardening and, and actually how that functions and just started thinking of all the components that we would like to have around us. Uh, the first thing that came along commercially was the natives nursery. The next thing we did was set up an orchard. We put in a lot of different trees. So and from that we learnt what did do really well here and such as avocados. So we knew that we could grow avocados successfully here. So recently I've just put in um, a 45 tree avocado orchard. I started growing garlic in the garden a few years ago and yeah, that kind of just grew as well um, out of a hobby. And then I started collecting different varieties and, and seeing how different things would go here. And then, yeah, I just started growing more and more at the gate and now I supply um, the local supermarket, tourists, um, some shops away. We have a mail order garlic service. So it's a very slowly evolving thing um, and we're gradually adding elements as we go. It really is an extension of the beef farming enterprise because we, we use the same resources, um, the land is there, um, the, the machinery that we use occasionally, it, it all comes from our farm. 
so we can just absorb the, the cost. Any farm could just extend and, and do some of these things because there's little pockets of land on farms that probably aren't being utilised as much as they could be. Um, and yeah, it just adds to the interest of the farm, it adds to our family life. Um, it's really great to be able to go and pick our own staff. We, we get to interact with, with tourists and, and the locals. We've had community groups come out and have a look around and people are really interested in what we're doing because it is a little bit different. Um, and it's a really lovely property. So that, that's probably one of the biggest things for me is that it's, it's a lovely place to be and work. It's, yeah, it's a reason to, to stay here. I go to work every day, really enjoying it. Andrew Whipple came to King Island in 2014 to work with Egg Cape as an overseer. He was born in central western New South Wales in a mixed farm operation with sheep, cattle and cropping. He has also completed a uni degree in ag business in 2012. He is now the manager for the Manana operation north of King Island at Ag Cap. Andrew will be talking about how he manages pastures on the farm and feed budgeting and why this is an important part of his management. Uh, so Manana is 750 hectares um, effective area. Um, it's then broken down into four main land classes. Uh, these land classes are then matched to the livestock classes. Um, from this that we are then able to set our rotations. Um, with the target with that we're, um, we've got to run one cow to the hectare and have a total of 380 kilos of beef produced per hectare per year. Uh, so Monday mornings full of um, moving cattle on, measuring pasture. Um, so we we try and plate as we go into the paddock with a rising plate meter, and then as the cattle come out, we plate them out, um, and that gives us a measurement of the intake of each animal, or intake across the whole mob, um, which then we can work out roughly what each animal's consuming, um, how many hectares we're eating a day, um, what our total demand is and if we're surplus or deficit in um, grass growth. The way we determine the rotation, um, we work out what they'll require their intakes each day, um, then how many is in the mob, um, our forecast of growth rate, and then we'll calculate the total area they'll need. At the moment we're on a 60 day round, uh, that's the main reason just to look after the country um, from any pugging and also so the animals only pass that country once throughout the wettest part of the season. Uh, once we hit the end of August we'll then start fastening our roundup and starting to eat more into the, the growth curve of the pasture to then start looking at trying to keep more quality in the round. So after the period of weaning um, we'll then start to box the cows up so your mobs the cows will then probably get between sort of 400 to 600 cows in a mob. Um, the main purpose of this is just so you can really hammer the paddock um, and also get the intake down on the cows um, back to their sort of maintenance requirement. Um, with the growing stock we sort of work around that um, 200 to 250 animals in a, in, a, um, in a mob but yeah the, the biggest limitation is to do with your um, paddock size and also with your water to try and uh, make sure that they're actually putting on as much weight as they can. One limitation running larger mobs is you've, you've really got to be on the ball when the weather does come in crook um, because the animals will, once they run out of um, sort of gut fill or feed, they'll get hungry and they will start to, to, to march, which will pug your paddocks. So we try and, uh, as it gets crook, we we make the mob smaller. So the best uh, the best part I enjoy about um, working on a beef property on King Island is the um, the ability that the climate gives you to keep growing pasture. Um, so even though when it does get dry, you still got some growth coming along. Um, I find that still very fascinating. That um, it just yeah it just keeps growing. <laughs> 
Gary Strickland is a second generation dairy farmer on King Island. He has a dairy farm in Marshalls Road, central King Island. Gary and Helen Strickland have been pioneers in many farming practices and have won many awards over the years. Gary does not supplement feed his cattle with hay or silage and uses cropping as a way of growing more feed during different times of the year. He will be telling how he does it and why this suits his operation. Yep, all, the, all the crops we grow are dry land crops um, and we don't irrigate any of, the, any of the crops and if you conserve the moisture properly at the start and do a good seed bed um, over here we found that we don't have to irrigate. We don't need more feed in the beef farm but, but when we do need the feed it's because of the pricing system we need it in the shoulders so we need to shift kilograms of dry matter ch as cheap as we can into the period say from Christmas time through to August we need to fill that in and we found out that the, the cheapest way of filling that feed gap in is through cropping and nitrogen. Um, to fill the feed gap in at, um, in December I'm sorry, late December and through till the middle of February we use pea and oats. So that's around 10 to 12 tonne of dry matter at six weeks that you're eating off. After we've eaten the pea and oats off, we would be going into maize, which this year was, the maize was crops were from 18 tonne through to 23 tonne of dry matter. And then we went on to brassicas, which was rape and pasture, and then um, we finished off with turnips which got us through till the end of June. Mm. If the crops are grown properly we reckon that we're putting feed into that period for around 12, between 12 and 18 cents a kilogram of dry matter mm. if, if you've got a good crop but if you, if you don't and you end up with a crop of 8, kilogram, eight tonne of dry matter instead of 16 well it, it triples your costs. Our soil preparation which is the most important part of growing crops consist of as soon as we can get the, the tractor onto the ground we have a tractor driver that works all the ground up rope hose it all once and if he falls behind we'll go ahead and we'll spray it we'll spray all the areas we haven't been on because we need to conserve all the moisture there the other important part is that you must do a good seed bed the pea and oats and the maize are drilled in so that one the birds can't get them and two is they're drilled into the moisture Brassicas and other crops we, we broadcast on and they probably need five or six mils of rain to get them started. And when we eat all the crops off up until the beginning of May, we then go in with an annual ryegrass, which is probably adrenaline ryegrass. So we would crop a paddock for four years. Mm -hmm. The first year is turnips because turnips tend to break down. If you've got an acid yeah. matter or so yeah. the turnips... Complex. We'll, we'll break it down. We eat the turnips off last so that quite often when you're eating the turnips off it's wet and muddy so the cows help pug it all up mm. and everything. And then the, the second year um, we would go to pea and oats and then the third year we would have a brassica of, of one sort and um, rape or pasture and then the fourth year we would put in maize and then when we eat the maize off we would sow that down to permanent pasture. Paige Williams was born on a mixed farm of dairy, beef and horses in Bandsdale, East Victoria. In 2014, after completing Cert 3, 4 and Diploma in Agriculture, she came to work with Egg Cap on King Island only at the age of 18. Josie Wright is a 21-year-old King Islander. She was raised on a family start Angus property on Ridges Road, Central King Island. Josie always loved being part of the farm duties and decided to study Cert 1, 2 and 3 in Agriculture. She works with Waverley Station and she is also completing Cert 4 and Diploma in Agriculture. This interview is about two young girls that chose Agriculture as their profession and sharing their passion for the industry. Oh, my passion for Agriculture came from growing up and living on a beef stub farm all my life, so two young years and um, uh, it's just all I've ever wanted to do. I uh, come off a farm in Victoria, working on the farm with mum and dad and Ed with the grandfather. Um, but yeah, it's always been a passion love working with cattle, especially um, Hereford's more than Angus. My duties on a day-to-day -day basis at 
um, SAFA monitoring cattle, checking cattle, moving cattle, uh, checking fences, water, maintaining the power in fences, um, also yard work as well, and also pasture management. Um, I'm pretty similar to Paige, I do most of our stock shifts and checking on our stock. Um, just having a passion for animals in general gets you out of bed and wanting to go to work every day. I think also too like working by yourself like you have to like working by yourself but it's also a good thing like you can be your own person and do things in your own time you don't really have anyone. Do it your own way. Yeah. Like, a day-to-day -day challenge it's just taking the time and thinking about what needs to be done not rushing things rushing just things. to get it done yeah. and making sure the job's done properly also another big one is time management I also think that we see things different to the boys yeah. like um, not picky on the boys or anything like that but I just notice sometimes I notice things that they don't pick up on and um, in 10 years time I will have hopefully travelled Australia a bit and um, broaden my knowledge of other different type of agriculture not just like beef production hopefully maybe have my own property and some little kidlets sharing the passion <laughs> for agriculture with me maybe I'm not sure that's what I'd like to do I'll see myself um, hopefully owning my own farm um, going off and completing my AI course and being accredited to be an AI technician um, also settling down and having a family as well at some stage and yeah also heading off around Australia and also to Canada and America to broaden my knowledge of the industry and see what they do as well. Um, Maybe we should just get married together and, <laughs> <laughs> and go into a business together. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do the same thing. It'd be a perfect match. That's it.